Um, so today I'm going to talk. I'm going to split up my talk into essentially three sections that are that I think will be meaningful. One, quick introduction about what we're doing with Cisco Intercloud Services. I'm going to keep the PowerPoint uh, hopefully to a minimum. I got about 10 to 12 slides that are, uh, you know, the the talk, and then I'm going to go into some slides that go over. Uh, the code that we're actually going to deploy. Um, then we're going to we're going to talk and, and, uh, in between. I should say we're going to talk about the different ways you can interact with our cloud platform. If you look at what is the intercloud, uh, we're essentially networking a bunch of our a bunch of clouds together. So, as you may or may not know, we have a Cisco uh, Cisco powered program, and for that we have. Uh, you know, around 175 to 200 uh, Cisco powered partners. So they're Cisco validated designs and uh, they're, they're, they're part of our ecosystem. In addition, uh, we also want to connect our enterprise private clouds. That's obvi obviously very important to many of our enterprises that may want to consume services with our Cisco powered cloud providers or with Cisco intercloud services, which is the box in the, box in the orange. Now, if we if we look at why you know what's the value to the to the inner cloud program, the first one is choice. You have the ability to deploy cloud infrastructures uh, in in a multitude of ways. I, I already mentioned with our inner cloud providers, enterprise private cloud, as well as inner cloud services. Uh, the other thing that you get out of this is uh, compliance. So. It's important to a lot of our customers because data sovereignty laws are no joke. In some countries, it's very important that you don't take workloads or data uh, out, out of country. Uh, so you'll see later on in the talk, I'll show you where we're live with, where we're live and where we're going to be live in the, in the short term uh, with Cisco Intercloud Services. And you can see how we're, we're kind of uh, attacking, attacking that potential problem. The other one is control. It's very important to our customers that we have control of cloud resources uh, as they're on the inner cloud. Um, this also falls a little bit into compliance because for security reasons, uh, our, our customers certainly certainly want to, uh, want to ensure that they have secure workloads in our cloud. Some of the key characteristics of Cisco intercloud services, our platform, is that it, it is a self-service public cloud platform with that said, we're offering a wider range of services on top of our cloud, and I'll, I'll get into that in, in, in a little bit. The next point that I think is worth mentioning is that it is based on open standards. So as you probably know, as you probably know how many of you have heard of OpenStack? Okay, so there's a, there's a heavy investment from Cisco uh, in OpenStack uh, as far as development, as far as validated, you know, validated designs and architectures, and we've also embraced it heavily uh, with, within Cisco, in, with Cisco Intercloud Services. Next one is global scale. The ability to work to move those workloads uh, potentially between Cisco Intercloud Services sites or to hybrid or you know in hybrid scenarios to uh, other cloud partners and that type of thing. Next one is APIs. This is an important one, especially we're in DevNet. We want to empower we want to empower developers to build cloud native applications. Uh, if you look at if you look at a lot of the the clouds that are out there today, a lot of them uh, outside of the you know outside of the you know the typical big big five ten, a lot of them uh, don't have a heavy focus on exposing APIs, which means they they're essentially infrastructure as a service type plays. Uh, without the without some ability to interact with the system. The last point is rapid innovation. So we built the, the cloud platform to be a place for rapid innovation. Now you're you're going to um, the flexibility that it gives our partners. It gives our partners the ability to build their their solutions in their data center. And these are our cloud provider partners. Uh, they can build their platforms inside their data center, but they can also leverage the platform that we're building uh, to push those cloud native apps uh, into, you know, into Cisco Intercloud services. Next point, you know, I talked about data sovereignty and, and, and its importance. You can see that we have a, a number of different locations on the slide here. 
we are already we already up in production with workloads in a number of these locations. Some of the locations are, are coming in the future, uh, but you can see that we're building across the globe. Uh, for, a, for a program that's you know, about a year, year and a couple months old, uh, we've definitely made, uh, definitely, definitely made a big impact globally. If you look at the overall services framework, uh, the best, best way to think about it, we have our platform, which is the Cisco Core, Core InterCloud Service, bleh, the Cisco InterCloud Services platform, which is, again, based on OpenStack and a number of other Cisco technologies and non-Cisco technologies. And then we offer some advanced platform services. And then on top of that, it, I'm sure you've heard of Marketplace. There's been a lot of buzz about Marketplace. The marketplace is that is that place that allows our ISVs and our partners to offer services as well on top of Cisco InterCloud. Uh, the enhanced platform services, uh, just the, the thing that's worth mentioning, we're talking about virtualized network functions, we're talking about big data uh, analytics. Uh, if you were here uh, about an hour ago, Karthik, one of my colleagues, uh, spent a lot of time talking about uh, Hadoop as a service and, and what we're doing with that. But it's really important, we're targeting to be the, the platform for the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. The next thing I'm going to talk about is interaction. And this comes down to how, develop, how developers can potentially interact with the platform. Now, this is, you don't have to be a developer to interact with the platform. It's key to understand that. Uh, but there are services, the services that I'll go through, the first one is API. So within OpenStack, there are a number of API services that are exposed, such as compute, network, storage, block storage, um, object storage, that type of thing. And that's what we'll look at, a, at a, just in just a little bit. But you also have other options to interact if you don't want to just go native with the APIs. You can use different software-defined kits. So if you, if you like... Uh, if you prefer to write your code in Python or you prefer to write your, your code in Ruby, uh, there, there are a number of SDK options that are available uh, to interact with the platform. Another option, which uh, is one that I'll demo al along with uh, uh, what we call Heat, which I'll go into in just a second, uh, is a CLI. So CLI is something that can be automated or non-automated. Uh, you can use it for checks and balances. You can use it to gather information from the system. Uh, but you'll, you'll get the gist if you're not familiar with the OpenStack CLI uh, whenever I go into the demo. This last one, which I think is important, I mentioned you, you don't have to necessarily be a developer to use the platform. Uh, that's certainly, certainly the target, because obviously the goal is to onboard cloud-native applications. But there's also a GUI, and I'll show you the GUI. It's OpenStack Horizon. From that GUI, uh, everything that I show you in the CLI or everything I show you that, that we deploy with, the, with our heat template, all of that can be done via the GUI as well, but it's iterative, clicks, 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 put in data, put in data. Uh, so it's obviously not a, you know, it's not a, it's not an automated, uh, it's not an automated interaction. Guess I'm walking too way too far away with the uh, with the clicker. Um, so as far as the developer platform, uh, I, the the three things I want to talk about within Cisco InterCloud Services. The first one is a heat template. A heat template bas basically allows you to describe a set of services that you'd like to deploy, and then deploy those services. Now that is not just about a VM. That's not just about a router, a virtual router. That's not about. That's not just about a subnet or a port. It's also about deploying an application, uh, and that's what we'll we'll get into. We're going to deploy a couple of applications as as we go in go further. The next thing, uh, how many of you have heard of Project Shift? Great. Um, so, in the last uh, I'll say two months, uh, we've announced Project Shift, which is really a developer platform as a service uh, set of tools. Project Shift gives you the ability to leverage to leverage a PaaS, which, is, which gives you a CI CD pipeline. So for a lot of, for a lot of customers, they're interested in, hey, how, how do I do DevOps? Or how do I get in, how, how can I uh, build this set of automated tools together so that I can 
so that I can deploy, deploy services or microservices. Project Shift is that platform, and I'm not going to go into a demo. If you caught uh, Ken Owen's session yesterday, uh, he, actually, he actually did a pretty nice demo that was, that was uh, well received. And uh, actually, he just, uh, if you follow him, follow him on Twitter or LinkedIn, he posted a slide, so definitely, definitely check it out. The last one is what I'll call uh, develop, you know, not developer platform, but platform as a service. Now this is where OpenShift and Cloud Foundry and that type of thing come in. A lot of our customers are at the point where they're exploring with Cloud Foundry or OpenShift. Some have made commitments, some are, some are embracing, some are developing, which is great. It's all great news. As, as it pertains to Cisco InterCloud Services, what, what, our, what these customers are doing right now is they're bringing their own and they're running, those, running that in tenant space. Now, that's, that's somewhat interesting, but the goal at the end of the day is to abstract, abstract the underlying infrastructure. Uh, so what we'll be doing is offering, uh, what I'll say, true platform as a service uh, in, in, a, in a managed manner within Cisco InterCloud Services. So that's a little bit of a future, but it doesn't stop you from getting started today. Uh, in your, in, you know, in your own project or, or your own environment. The last part uh, is where we'll, we'll spend a spend a bulk of our time is around the demo. So I'll start with a little bit of an overview on the demo. So what are we deploying? We're going to deploy some resources with heat, instances, ports, networks, and routers. Ports connect instances to networks. Easiest way to think about it. Uh, interfaces connect those networks to routers. Makes sense. Applications, so as far as the applications go, we're gonna de actually deploy two applications. One is a simple web, web app, and then that second one uh, is a web app that's written in Python that uses a Flask framework, and this is essentially a, a microblogging application. I'm not gonna I'm not going to start blogging or anything like that, but I'll, I'm going to start it up. I'll show you. I'll register, and you can you can see how quick and easy it is to to spin up uh, that application. What's what's key to note? It's essentially has nginx as a front end, and uh, it, that's used as a reverse proxy to expose to expose the web application. Now, can you can you guys actually see the uh, no? Okay. So I'll just kind of jump through here. Is this, is this better? Oh, really? Is that better? Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just kind of I'll kind of go through this. Let's see. So you can see this first part. Within this first part, you can see that we're creating some networks and subnets. They're called what I've named them: Flasky subnet, Flasky network. This is simply a network and a subnet for that Flask application that I mentioned before. Uh, right below that, you're going to see a general web app network. And that network is for, for, that, for that other application I mentioned that, that will be uh, just a very simple web app. And that's, that's everything that's covered from general web network, general web subnet. What you can see in here is that we've, these are, there are types. Within, tight, within the network subcomponent of OpenStack, these are essentially neutron, uh, neutron networks, neutron subnets. You can see that we uh, identify what the, what, the, what the actual subnet is in CIDR notation. Uh, and then what you can also see is that down here, we have some parameters. So network ID, we're saying get resource general web network. So that, that, that is essentially a call to general web network. The last part is where we're actually deploying a neutron router. 
So for this, we're just calling a heat router 01. You can see that we also define a gateway. We need a gateway because we're going to, going to enable some floating IP addresses. Uh, and obviously, the, you, you, need, you need logically traffic to get in and out of that router. So that's the, that would be the northbound, northbound direct way out of, the, out of the virtual infrastructure. You can see that down here, we're calling a network ID. This network ID uh, is simply a network that it's the floating IP network or the public network uh, that is in this particular region. You can see that we're calling a UUID, so it's a unique identifier of that network. Uh, let's see. The next set of resources that we call are interfaces. So we need an interface for each network. We have interface zero, uh, which you can see is, is getting, is getting uh, the resource Flasky subnet. And then we have interface one, which you can see is getting the resource General Web 01. Uh, it's also getting the resource that heat router 01 that we also went ahead and created, created earlier on. Now I mentioned you also need ports. Ports connect instances to networks. So here we, we've defined two ports, the Flasky port and the web app port. So that gives your VM the ability to get, connect to the network. The last part is actually the, the floating IP configuration. So here we have, we have two floating IPs, one for the Flask application, one for the general web application. Uh, you can also see, I mentioned that UUID, we're calling that same UUID, and I'll show you a, a visual rep representation in a little bit that is that general public, or I'm sorry, that our public subnet, uh, so our you know, public IP addresses. Now the next set of configuration is actually for the instance. So the instance is the VM. So what do we do with the VM? We're going to spin up a VM. Now you can see, as you can see in here, we have a bunch of, bunch of different things. We have, we're identifying a name, we're identifying the image to use. So as far as image, I'm using, I'm using a Ubuntu uh, trusty 1404 image. You can also see the, diff the flavor. Uh, flavor, we have a bunch of different flavors that we option, uh, that, that we offer, uh, as you would with, uh, with other, you know, obviously other cloud platforms. So we have about 20 different flavors from general purpose to storage optimized, memory optimized, uh, that kind of thing. Now you can also see we reference the port. So we're getting resource Flasky port 01. That's how we're connecting the instance to the network. The last part, we're gonna, we're gonna put in some user data. This user data, so that we can actually go uh, get all of the get all of the dependent dependencies that we may need to spin up that application. So we're going to install packages. We're also going to start those start some of those packages, uh, and all of that's all of that's you know throughout the throughout the code here. The last one is the web app instance. So it's a very similar idea. We have a, a general web app instance. You see the flavor, the image, the name. Now, down here, we're using config drive again. So you can see that, that essentially what we do, we're going to install dependencies. We're going to install Apache. We're going to install Git. And then we're going to clone what we've already, what the, work, the application that we've written in Git. In this example, it's some HTML files and an image. And then obviously once, whoops, once we clone, once we clone that data, then we're going to move those, move those files where they need to be, so they're, ex, so that they're exposed via Ubuntu in the in the www directory. Now we'll jump into the actual demo. All right, 
So first thing, I want to, first thing I'll show you is I mentioned API services that we expose. Uh, if you look in here, you can see what, what, what we do is we monitor all of the, the different services that are exposed from, uh, from our various OpenStack environments. In our example, we're down in Texas. So you can see that we have Cinder, Glance, Neutron, Nova, Swift. So these are our storage network, uh, storage network and, ob and obviously our compute API services. This is what gives us the ability to actually make API calls into the system. So if something isn't working for some reason, we can simply check the, the health page and uh, identify if there may or may not be an issue. Now we'll go ahead and jump into the console. And what we're going to do, uh, so I have a project that's in one of our regions, which is US Texas 1. And we're going to jump into US Texas 1, and I'll, we'll take a look at uh, take a look at our project. Project that we're using is our is a, an environment that I use to deploy different different templated configurations. What I'll call out quickly is that if you go to network topology, you can see that the only thing that's here are the are the networks that are here by default. So these are uh, essentially provider networks that are that are available to all to all tenants that are on the platform. I mentioned that, that floating IP network, that's the blue network that's labeled public floating 601. So as you're assigned a public IP address, it's pulled from that, from that, from that network set. Next thing I'll do, we'll go ahead and actually deploy the template that I was showing you uh, that we just walked through. Now, as you can see, we went ahead and hit stack create now, additionally, you, didn't, you don't have to do this from the CLI. I'm doing it from the CLI just so you, that you can simply see that from this Ubuntu machine, virtual machine that's on my, my laptop here, that you can kick off that, kick off that template. And as you, go back to, as you go back to our environment, you can see that, we've, see that we're spinning up resources now in our network topology. Alternatively, if you didn't want to use the CLI and you simply wanted to load your, your, load your script into uh, the GUI, you could have done it by simply going into the orchestration and then stacks location in, in Horizon, and you could have clicked launch stack, and that, that, that's another way you could have deployed. So you don't necessarily need to be, the, be a CLI, CLI expert, but it's a, it's a useful option. What we can see, if we click on Flasky, which is the name of the stack that I, that I used, you can see all the different resources that we're actually deploying. So you'll see the instances, the ports, the networks, and, and uh, ultimately the, the VMs. So it's going to take a it's just going to take a you know a minute or two for the um, to, for the VMs to spin up. And once the VMs actually spin up and get their you know get the code, then we'll be able to to look at what we've actually deployed. If you go to the resources tab. In the resources tab, you can see all those resources that I that I basically walked you through earlier. You can see that they're all identified here. They all they all they all also have corresponding UUIDs. So you can you can you you, know, you can look and track at what's what's been deployed, what what type of resource it is, uh, and you can also see what the actual state is. So you can see that the Flasky instance, it's still in progress. You know the the. The longest pull in the tent is spinning up the VM, loading the operating system. Uh, cannot, you know, that's that's the way it is. <laughs> now, while that's while that's working, I'll show you some some other things you can do via the CLI. Uh, so I just showed you the different resources. Now I'll, invo I'll invoke a command which is basically calling the Nova IP or the Nova API, and it will list the different the different instances that we've went ahead and and told our heat template to spin up. So you can see that we have a Flasky instance. You can see we have a web app instance. All, all of those were notated in the configuration that we generated. If we also want to look at network type, type things, we can jump down here. We can do a um, you know, router list, which will show us the router. VPN's a little slow. Sorry about that. Could also generate the network list, so you can see the networks. All of this I showed you in the GUI, but 
general idea. You can you can also see you know see all this information via the CLI. You can also see that all of these all of these named resources also have UUIDs, which are are specific to the to the resources. What we need to do before we can obviously uh, access our application is we need to, okay. We need to grab the floating IPs. My, uh, my mouse isn't functioning there, so let's just we'll come in here real quick. So the first thing we'll do is we'll grab the flask the Flasky IP address. Okay, that one's still loading. You can see that the the other uh, the general web app, general web app, relatively quick. If there's not an Nginx front end, there's not a database that has to spin up. But well, you can see that the, the web application came up. Uh, you know, thanks for joining the session. Definitely appreciate it. And we'll see if uh, see if our Flasky, where we're at. Now you can see that our our Flask uh, application is live. We can go to log in. We don't have a user. We don't have a user ID and password. It's a new you know new fresh application. So we'll go ahead and register. And at that point, it sends me a notification, and from there I can click to verify and start using my microblogging application. And that's, uh, I mean, that, that's the demo. Now let me just jump, jump to one, one last slide that will actually be visible. These will get posted, but what, where to go next? What, you know, what other documentation? Um, including, including some links. So uh, on the uh, DevNet site, we have a section dedicated to Cisco InterCloud Services. Definitely make sure you check it out. There's lots of, lots of useful information. Also included some links to blogs as well as the jump, the jump page for Project Shift so you can get information about Project Shift. Uh, you can also read uh, the second blog, which is the one that has open framework in the URL. Uh, that's a blog that really goes over the project shift architecture and talks about Marathon, Mesos, uh, console, what roles they play in the microservices architecture. So definitely check it out. Uh, and also in, I'm including some links so you can get started with heat templates. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. You know, I showed you a, 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 an example with one single heat template, but you can also nest heat templates and it, the, the uh, usefulness gets quite powerful. Uh, I'm right about at time, but does anyone anyone have any questions? Nope. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it.